I want to talk today about some common functional groups that you encounter in organic chemistry. Start off talking about alkenes, which are simply molecules with double bonds in them like this. And you can see you can have four possible different substituents on the double bond. There are four places coming off of the alkene. They can be hydrogens, they can be carbons, they can be halogens, they can be pretty much anything. The alkene functional group tends to be nonpolar, having only um, London dispersion forces as its major intermolecular force. An example of an alkene is something like this shown here. This is a rather more complicated one. It's uh, This is vitamin A, and you can see all of the alkenes, the double bonds in this molecule. Next, I want to look at alkynes, which are molecules containing triple bonds. Similar to alkenes, they're not a nonpolar functional group, tending to have only London dispersion forces. Notice that the bond angle on the alkene is 120 sp2 hybridized. This is sp hybridized, so it tend, it, it, it's linear. Uh, example of an alkyne is this one right here. You can see the triple bond right here. This also has a bunch of other functional groups in it. This is an oral steroid, oral contraceptive. It's a steroid used as an oral contraceptive. Next, I want to talk about alkyl halides. They have the general formula, formula Rx, where X is any halogen. Again, this is a nonpolar functional group, usually having only um, London dispersion forces, but they're also some dipole-dipole forces involved that make them, them slightly polar. As an example of an alkyl halide, I want to look at this molecule, isofluorane, which is used as an anesthetic for uh, putting people to sleep during surgeries and so on. Next, I want to talk about the alcohol functional group, which has the journal formula ROH. This is a polar functional group. The polar makes polar molecules depending on what R is and it has dipole, dipole, and H-bonding interactions on this OH group. As an example of this, we can talk about simple like ethanol, but you'll notice that two of our other sample molecules also have the OH functional group incorporated with them. So OH is a fairly common widespread functional group, and it can have very simple R groups, or it can have rather complicated R groups attached to it. Next, I want to talk about ethers, which have this general um, structure of two R groups surrounding an oxygen. They tend to be somewhat polar with dipole-dipole interactions. The oxygen is more polar than the carbon attached to it and gives you a dipole. An example, there are many examples of ethers. One interesting example is this molecule right here, which is brevitoxin. It's an incredibly... Um, Toxic, I believe it's a marine natural product, but you can see it has multiple ether linkages in it. It's a polyether. And there are many examples of e biologically interesting ethers and other types of ethers. And to be similar to ethers are sulfides that have RSR instead of ROR, but they tend to be more nonpolar than ethers. The sulfur is less electronegative than the oxygen, so the carbon-sulfur bond is less polarized, and these molecules tend to be more nonpolar than ethers. Important and interesting examples of sulfides. One of them is this molecule right here, penicillin G. You can see the penicillin G has many other functional groups in it besides just the sulfide, but that's the one we're focusing on right now. We can also talk about thiols, which have the general structure RSH, which look a lot like alcohols, which were ROH, but again, since oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur, or sulfur is less electronegative, they tend to be less polar than alcohols, and I'm going to characterize these as slightly polar. They have some dipole-dipole interactions in them. They don't really hydrogen bond like alcohols. We'll call them slightly polar. Thiols are compounds that you don't want to work with unless you really know what you're doing. It's just as an example, my first day in graduate school at Brown, um, I was working with thiols. They were shipped to me improperly. They had leaked into the packaging, and I threw out the packaging in the trash. And basically, my first day in graduate school, I cleared out the entire chemistry building of Brown uh, University because of the thiols I disposed of improperly. And you can see, as in this graphic, um, skunk sprite is composed of a mixture of uh, 
basically three different thiols. So lesson to take home, thiols smell really bad. Functional group I want to talk about are disulfides. They have this form where you have two sulfurs bonded together in the middle of the molecule. They tend to be nonpolar molecules depending on what the R groups are. I'm not going to show a specific example of a disulfide bond in organic chemistry. They tend to be really common in proteins in reinforcing secondary structures. So thiol containing amino acids well, amino acids with thiol side chains will form disulfide bonds in proteins a lot. To look at epoxides, which you can see are three-membered ring ethers. So an ether and a three-membered ring. And just like regular ethers, you get dipole-dipole interactions between the oxygen and the carbons they're bonded to. Epoxides tend to be reactive intermediates in making other compounds. You don't usually see an epoxide in itself being the final product that we're talking about or dealing with. We usually use them to make other things. However, we can talk about aromatic epoxides like this one, which is one of the carcinogenic um, byproducts of cigarette smoke. And it's this epoxide that makes it particularly mutagenic. Next, I want to look at, am at amines, which is have this general structure where N equals is in the middle, surrounded by three R groups. None of these R groups are carbonyls. They're all alkyl groups. And um, they can be hydrogens also. And they're polar molecules. And they're, the intermolecular forces are definitely dipole-dipole. Nitrogen is more polar, more electronegative than the carbons that it's attached to. And if any of these R groups are H's, it can also undergo H bonding. An example of an amine, and there are many examples, there are many examples of um, amines. One good example is the thyroid hormone T4. You can see there's an NH2 here. This is a primary amine because it only has one carbon and two hydrogen groups on it. Um, I could have also used this. You can see many molecules have many different um, functional groups. I could have used this as an example of an ether or an alcohol or an alkyl halide. And you could see, I'm going to talk about carboxylic acids in a little while. This could have also been an example of a carboxylic acid. Of carboxylic acids. Um, that's the functional group I'm going to talk about next. You'll see them written in a variety of different ways. Sometimes you'll see them written as RCO2H. Sometimes you'll see them written as RCOOH. The structure is like this with a carbon double bonded to an oxygen and single bonded to an OH. These are acidic molecules. We'll talk about... Um, their acidity in the chapter on carboxylic acids. What you need to know now is that they are polar molecules because they're dipole-dipole interactions and they're very definitely very good hydrogen bonders. We have an example of a carboxylic acid right here. There are many naturally occurring carboxylic acids. One example of a tricarboxylic acid, a molecule with three carboxylic acid groups, in is citric acid, shown right here. I want to talk about um, ketones, where we have this general form where we have a C double bond O with two R groups on it. In order for it to be a ketone, neither of these R groups can be H. They have to be carbon containing. These molecules are somewhat polar because of the um, dipole dipole. This carbon is less electronegative than the oxygen, so it's partially positive, the oxygen partially negative. One, there are many examples of ketones. One example is this compound right here. It's called Z jasmine. You can see the ketone functionality right there. This has the aroma of jasmine. One of these R groups is a hydrogen. We call the molecule an aldehyde and it has similar properties to the ketone in that it's somewhat polar because of the dipole dipole between the carbon and the oxygen. An example of an aldehyde compound right here. You can see the carp the aldehyde functional group is called vanillin and not surprisingly it's responsible for the flavor of vanilla. Next functional group I want to talk about is the amid and comparing to the aldehyde and the ketone you can see that we've replaced one of the R groups or the H with a nitrogen and the nitrogen and have two other things coming off of it. These could both be carbons, these could both be hydrogens, one could be a hydrogen, one could be a, a carbon. It's a polar functional group. It has dipole-dipole interactions because the nitrogen and the oxygen are more electronegative than the carbon. And if one of these two groups, R2 or R3, is a hydrogen, it can also undergo hydrogen bonding. 
there are many examples of amides. The amide bond is the bond that holds together the structure of proteins and peptides. We've also seen amide bonds in some of the examples we've looked at before, such as penicillin G we talked about earlier. You can see there's an amide bond here. One of the R groups is an H, and you can see there's a mid bond here where both of the R groups are carbon containing things. Functional groups I want to talk about just really quickly in passing, not because they're not important, but because we don't normally make them to keep them, but we make them to make other molecules like acid chlorides are usually made to make a compound like an amide or an ester or something like that. And acid chlorides have the C double bond O, they have the R, and they have X, where X is chlorine or bromine. The acid anhydrides, they have this general structure. Two carbonyls with an oxygen in the middle are generally only made when we're using, the, we only use them to make other compounds. So I don't want to spend too much time talking about them. The last functional group I want to talk about today is an ester. Esters have this general structure, C double bond O with an OR, similar to a mid with the oxygen in place of the nitrogen. They tend to be somewhat polar and they can form dipole-dipole bonds because the carbon is a less electronegative than the oxygen. There are lots of examples of esters. Esters are usually responsible for flavors and smells. A lot of them are. Example of this, I want to talk about, I want to show you a table generated by this person who teaches chemistry in Melbourne, Australia. It's a table showing the es different esters and their smells. And you can see there's a complicated table here. It looks really, really detailed and it's very small. We're going to have to zoom in to look at it. So let me zoom in. I'm not going to talk about the, the uh, rules for naming the structures of esters today, but you can see that some esters have the aroma of apples or bananas, or I guess this is grapefruit. These are pineapples. This looks like um, blackberries, I think. This, I think, is some kind of mint. We scroll down. This is coconuts. Um, this is, I guess, oranges. This is some kind of flower. We've got strawberries here. Um, so you can see that esters are very commonly um, represented by the compounds that are responsible for the smells of different um, molecules, different, different fruits and vegetables and so on.